Welcome to CRU. CRU stands for, I hope you said it. CRU stands for Christians Rising, Christians Rising Up. It's been so long since we've been together. I mean, it's been since March. What's that, about eight months? Wow, I miss you all so very much. I miss standing before you and asking what CRU stands for. Christians Rising Up. It's our youth group here at the Kingdom Church. And I just miss you all. I can't wait for the day for us to be back together. Maybe if not at the end of this year, the beginning of next year in 2021, brand new year, brand new space here. We're getting, still getting it ready for you, still um, doing the painting and the carpet and, and windows even. It's a lot to do and it's a process, but we'll make it special just for you. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for today. We thank you, God, for this opportunity to learn more about you, to grow closer to you, God, to be the people who you've called us to be. We thank you, God, that it's possible. We thank you, God, that all things are possible with you, God. We can uh, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's be honest. We've all done something we shouldn't have done. I remember um, growing up, this was before um, Call ID. So it was pretty much before cell phones too. I know I'm dating myself, but I'm young at heart. Uh, so I remember when we just had a phone in the house, in our house, and um, it was very popular to prank call people. So let me explain to you what this is. Uh, pretty much you could call anybody <laughs> and say anything and hang up and they wouldn't know it was you because there was no call ID. There was no way for them to call you back. You can just hide behind that phone call. So you could like say, hello, is your, is your fridge running? You better go catch it <laughs> and hang up. <laughs> you could call and ask um, all kind of weird questions. You could just really annoy people. Um, and no one would know. You could hide behind the fact that you were on the telephone and there was no way for them to know who you were. So we've all done some things that we shouldn't have done and have tried to hide from them. Um, whether you lied about maybe who was at a party that you promised um, that it wouldn't be that crowd maybe to your parents, or if you hacked into a system to make your parents, uh, make sure that your parents didn't get a notification for something that you were looking at on your phone. Um, or head into a system so your parents didn't get a notification of a grade you made on your test. Or you're keeping secrets in your Snapchat. And pray that your DMs are never accidentally posted. Maybe you pretended that a bad decision was all someone else's idea and not your own. It's all a form of hiding. And it's not a teenager thing. It's not a you thing. It's a everybody thing. I mean, if you really think about it, even the first adults, the first humans um, hid once they ate that fruit. Adam and Eve hid from God. God came and said, hey, Adam, where are you? They even hid once they knew they did something wrong. So it's a human thing. And so with the first mistake that man ever made, the first reaction was to hide. So even like the first humans, we all have a tendency to just to hide from our teachers, to hide from social media followers, to hide from our parents. Um, and sometimes we try to hide from God too. And what do I mean by like hiding from God? Well, sometimes we hide by we pray less, we show up less to things that we know that are good and right. We speak up less maybe, we keep our distance from God and sometimes even his people. So maybe you didn't answer that phone call from that person that knew they were gonna ask you if you did what you were supposed to do, if you did the right thing. So sometimes we hide, um, and it's easy to talk about God's love in theory, but when we mess up, things get personal, and it just feels different. We feel like maybe that God doesn't love us as much anymore, or that we're too far away from God. But there's always more to the story. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Maybe just so that you can change the way that you see God and change the way you even see yourself. So we're going to talk about um, a guy named Zacchaeus today. And we're going to be in the book of Luke. So if you want to go ahead and grab your phone or your Bible, um, your phone with the Bible app, we're going to talk about that. Um, just a quick recap. So Jesus was on his way to the cross. 
He was still going through different cities or whatnot. By this time, he's like super famous. Um, people have heard of what he's done. People have seen what he's done. People are following him around. Um, so he has a lot of followers and he has no social media and he still has followers. He was like the first person to have followers. That's how cool he is um, at this point. Um, and as he's going through one of the city, he pauses um, because he sees this guy, Zacchaeus, um, who's sitting up in a tree. So everybody else is kind of following him around, trying to get close to him, like mob mentality. And then he notices this guy that's sitting in a tree. And so basically it's Zacchaeus. And just to give you a little background about Zacchaeus, um, in our modern day, he would be a sellout. He would be a thief. He would be a corrupt person um, because he was a tax collector and he was a Roman tax collector. And so they were known, they had a reputation for cheating people, for keeping some of the money for themselves, for misusing um, people's monies, for charging them more for taxes than they're supposed to. He had that reputation, every tax collector had that reputation. And so some people kind of think maybe he was up there so because people wouldn't recognize him so he can be up and away from it. But the Bible also says he was kind of short in stature, so maybe he just couldn't see um, around a lot of people. So he went up a little higher to see Jesus. So the Bible basically says that Jesus says to him, come down out of that tree. I'm going to your house. We're going to throw a party. That's kind of paraphrasing what Jesus says. Now it sounds, if it sounds confusing, it is, um, or maybe it is because people were not happy about that. Like all these other good people, good people, we're following around Jesus. We're talking about people that have been praying for Jesus to come. We're talking about people that have worshiped um, God in the different synagogues and the different churches back then, made sacrifices to God, people who had chosen to do right instead of wrong. And he's just letting these people just walk around him and they're coming following him. And he stops for this guy that everybody knows is not a good guy. That's a bad guy. And so not only does he stop for this guy, not only does he call him by name, but he says, come on, man, let's go down to your house. Let's have a party. Let's have a feast. Let's eat together. So you can imagine people were not happy with this. So as we continue the story, um, nobody liked Zacchaeus. He had a pretty bad reputation. People called him a notorious sinner, um, pretty much a big screw up, uh, <clears throat> but Jesus saw him where he was, um, and he actually asked to spend time with him. So let's read in Luke 19, Luke 19, starting at the fifth verse, and we're going to read two verses here. I'll be reading from the NLT version. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest at your house today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. When Jesus passed by and called Zacchaeus, it was out of love. Zacchaeus accepted it. Time after time in the Bible, we see where God has constantly seeking, even Jesus is constantly seeking after people who have messed up and he extends that love to them. He knew Zacchaeus was a bad guy in their culture, in their city, but he called out to him, he went after him, even though he has done some things he shouldn't have done. You may remember the Apostle Paul, a not so good guy. I mean, this guy literally was killing Christians because they said they were Christians. Until Jesus met him on the road one day in a form, in a, in a form of a light and drew Paul into him. Jesus took that time to draw Paul, this, not, this bad guy, and bring him into the light of who he was. So if you think about all of this, um, let's read what Paul wrote in the book of Romans. Romans 8, verse 39. Again, I'm gonna read from the new NLT version. Romans 8 and 39, Paul said this, no power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I'm gonna read it one more time. Nothing, no power in the sky, in the sky above or the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us 
from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. We all know Christ loved us so much, he died on the cross for our sins, but nothing can separate us from the love. I think of the song of uh, reckless love, right? There's no mountain he won't climb up, right? Um, no shadow he won't light up coming after me, right? And so nothing. Here's what that means for you. God's love is not a sliding scale or dependent on how good we think we are or how bad we think we are. Even if you did something that caused a permanent situation, even if you keep on doing that thing, even if we said this is gonna be the last time and it really wasn't, even if whatever fill in the blank, he knows we will fail. He knows we won't always get it right. And even with that knowledge, he still loves us. If he, since he woke you up this morning and you're able to watch this video, he's given you another opportunity to get it right. Not to be good, but to get it right. To do things righteously, his way. Because of Jesus, God does not hold our past mistakes of, or future failures against us. In other words, it's personal because Jesus loves you no matter what, no matter what. There's nothing that you have done that you have to feel shame or guilt of so much to not remember that he loves you. Remember that you are enough. You are enough. What you, who you are is enough for God to love you. That's why you're alive right now. Cause his love and his grace and his mercy is giving you another day. Well, you may look at me and say, well, that's great, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've thought. You don't know what I'm planning on doing, but you know who knows? <laughs> God knows. And I'm telling you, he still loves you. That's why you still have breath in your body. One of the things I remember and I tell myself is I can trust God with not just the parts of me that do right, but also with the parts of me that do wrong. Sometimes we just think that God is watching how much we pray, how much we worship, and that God isn't concerned about helping us get right and do better, that it's just all on us. When God is not really set up that his word that way and his will that way, he's there for us, loving us. Um, the Bible even says that he chastens those that he loves. And so he guides us and directs us back in the way because he loves us, not to harm us, not to uh, put us down, not to condemn us, not to make us feel worse, but because he loves us. Sometimes we allow ourselves to live in the guilt and the shame of one or two, or maybe even a few messed up things we've done. We judge ourselves and think God will never forgive me of this. Maybe you hurt somebody or you wrongly, wrongfully took advantage of someone. Maybe you have a secret that you know that you're holding on to, but you're just afraid of what will happen if you let it out. You have a choice, just like Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus positioned himself for Jesus to see him. I mean, Zacchaeus was no longer hiding. I mean, this was a man in a tree. <laughs> like, there's no way you got it. That's one, probably one of the reasons why Jesus notices him, him because he was up in a tree. Like, who does that, right? So we must come clean. We must kind of do the same thing, make ourselves visible to God in the sense that we name it. That's the first thing I want you to do, name it. Whatever you're feeling is separating from you from God, name it. Call it out for what it is a secret, a hurt, uh, taking advantage of a situation, whatever it is, name it. Write it on a piece of paper, tell a trusted adult, scream it to the top of your lungs if you need to. Whatever it is, be honest and name it. Number two, I want you to confess it. God is big enough to handle the worst and the best part of our lives. He already knows about it anyway, but confess it. Talk to God about how this past failure has made you feel. Ask him to show you in your everyday life how he sees you and how he loves you. He still sees you as his child. He still sees you as someone he loves. He still sees you as his creation. He still sees you as a person of purpose and reason to be alive. So confess it, confess it to him. Have that intimate, that close conversation with him. And the third thing is check it, check and see if if you're looking at people differently. These people thought that Zacchaeus should not have been the place that Jesus let come to his house. How are you looking at people? 
Are you treating people like, oh, God shouldn't forgive them for that. Oh, I know I wouldn't forgive them for that. How are you looking at people? Check your heart and see if you are loving people the way that Jesus loved people. And accept the fact that Jesus loves you. That's never going to change. Jesus loves you. If you ever heard it lately, Jesus loves you. So living in faith means that we're willing to be courageous and trust God with our full self and the good and the bad and the neutral, the indifferent. We're able to trust God. Every fragment, every broken piece, every lie, every judgment, every insecurity, everything. We're able to trust God with that because he loves us. You also need a group of people around you that you know personally, who know your story, who love you when you mess up. We have, sometimes have a funny definition of love, but I'm talking about an unconditional love. People that will tell you when you're wrong, but they will also help you do right. You need a safe person, a leader. If you haven't had a leader here reach out to you, here's your opportunity. I want you to text the word CRU, C-R-U. I want you to text C-R-U to 407-449-8884. So text the word CRU, C-R-U, to 407-449-8884. And I guarantee you, one of us will reach out to you with love, see how you're doing. We'll pray with you. We'll hold you accountable to those things that you feel like you may not be doing right. We'll actually help you if you need some other assistance beyond what we can do for you. But text that word to you. We want to hear from you. We want to reach out to you. We want to love on you with the love of God. God loves you and he likes you <laughs> and is with you no matter what. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Let's pray. Thank you, God, that you are forever with us, God. Thank you, God, that you will never leave us, God, that you'll never do us wrong, that you love us with an unconditional love. Without any conditions, you love us. You sent your son to die for us, to save us from our sins and our wrongdoings, God. Help us, God to love you even more each day, God. Help us, God, to name our sins and to name the things that we've done wrong, to confess it to you, God, to confess where we are with it, God, and help us, God, to reach out to others, to help us, to hold us accountable, to never do them again. Help us to grow, God. We just want to be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Until next time, I love you and so does God.